Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 39 of PD's Awesome Guest Panel, and it's the first episode of the new year, and what a guest star we have tonight. You may know she's a, a veteran, legendary voice actress who has done many voiceover works in, the, you know, the past years. I mean, you may remember from, su you know, from such shows as Rugrats and DuckTales and Duckman. Oh, and let's not forget the Smurfs. But as well as American uh, cartoon films such as American Tale and one of my favorite Scooby Doo movies, Scooby Doo and the Ghoul School. My guest at this time is Miss Pat Music. Pat, how are you today? Welcome. I'm good, Petey. Thank you so much for this. This is so fun. Thank you. I was so impressed. I looked at some of your other interviews and I thought, what a great thing to be able to just do this on your own, you know, come up with, okay, I'm going to do a platform and I'm going to go after the people I've always liked. And uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. Thank you. Absolutely. And you're one person, you know, like I had I had Sue Blue on here like two weeks ago and I talked about how much like you, you and the late great, uh, you, Sue, the late great Rusi Taylor and Marilyn Schleffer and Patty Maloney, I always call them the fun five. Oh, wow. Well, uh, I'm honored to be included in that group. That's a pretty amazing group. Susan and I have been friends. I don't even know. I, I can't, I don't know if I can think back that far. We met uh, when we were auditioning, I think for commercials in the, out in the, out in the uh, auditioning room. We ended up, you know, having a conversation and just, we've been good friends ever since, best friends ever since. She's a doll, really good person. That's awesome. You guys worked on a lot of projects together, and much, much like Sue, you also run the gamut with voice ranges. Like, you can go high, like Elsa Frankenstein, and then you can go really, like, like you know, high-pitched, like Fluffy and Uranus on Duckman, and you go, like, Mr. Duckman! Yes. Yeah, that was really fun, um, because that, at that audition, they really had just come up with the idea for the characters of Fluffy and Uranus. And they were like, hey, we've got this weird idea. What do you think? And uh, I immediately just kind of saw who they were and gave them just enough distinction in the in the voice that you could tell the difference, although they're really basically one person. But th the most fun of that was the fact that Duckman was always killing us, you know. Um, he would throw us up into a fan, he mixed us in a blender, he treated us very badly. But it was always fun because we'd be back there for the next episode, yeah. so. Be before there was Kenny from South Park, we had Fluffy and Uranus, like, that were, that, they would die in one episode, but they would come back the very next episode totally unharmed. Exactly. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, Duckman himself was just so wonderfully rude and awful and terrible, but Fluffy and Uranus just adored him, you know. Whatever you say, Mr. Duckman, you know, they just loved him. So uh, it was very fun, very fun. And Greg Berger was on that show. Jason Alexander as Duckman. I mean, you can't really do a lot better than that. It was really, really great. I agree. And before, because I have a, to a lot of Duckman questions I, I want to ask. Like, but before we do, I just want to know, like, when did you get your first big break in voice acting? Um, that would have to be uh, Smurfs. Um, because, uh, I had done a, I had done a, um, a workshop with Andrea Romano and, uh, who ended up becoming at the time she wasn't, she was, uh, Gordon Hunt's assistant. He was the director at Hanna-Barbera and, uh, she was teaching a workshop and somebody recommended that, oh, actually it was Michael Bell's workshop. And she came in as the guest speaker on the last, the last class. And uh, she and I just got along famously right away. And so she sort of recommended me for the Smurfs thing. I think God had gotten an agent and uh, got, got to audition for uh, Smurfs and got the role of Snappy, and who uh, at the time I based on my dog um, because <laughs> I had this little feisty dog you know, running around like, Papa Smurf, you're this, you're that, you know, and, and this, so this little dog uh, just became kind of the template for Snappy, and uh, and uh, that was a very fun, oh gosh, the people I got to work with, my first day showing up at work for that, I walk into Hanna-Barbera early, of course, terrified about being late, walk into the uh, front lobby, which basically you never really went there after you started working you always went in the back door but i didn't know that at the time and uh i walk in i'd say to the you know receptionist i'm here to for smurfs and so i sit down and over in the corner is just 
a newspaper. That's all I see is just this giant newspapers being held up. And um, from behind the nurse newspaper, and I, I wouldn't dare try to do her voice, but she said, are you here for Smurfs? And I said, yes, yes, I am, yes. And she goes, mm, mm-hmm. Still behind the paper. And I said, so, so are you on the show? And she goes, mm-hmm. I said, oh, great, great. Uh, well, I'm Pat Music. Nice to meet you. She said, I'm June Foray. Hello. And the paper went back up and I just about fainted. I mean, there was Rocket J Squirrel and every other voice I had ever gone mad for in my life, Natasha, and, you know, all of the voices she did, way too many to name, but she was Jokey Smurf. And so, you know, she said, well, yes, nice to meet you. And I understood later on that she was a little bit not so thrilled initially because they brought us in as Smurflings and it was just to sort of goose up the show, which had been on the air for, I don't know how many years at that point. Um, but uh, this was 1984. And, and so uh, we went back into the thing and then ultimately with all of the other amazing voiceover people on that show, um, gosh, Don Messick, Alan Young, Frank Welker, uh, Lucille Bliss. Uh, these were like the lions, the titans of, of cartoon voiceover. And so I just kind of slunk into my, <laughs> my place. But it was great because Charlie Adler came in as one of the other Smurflings, uh, who is one of my dearest friends to this day. And one of the most, not only brilliant voiceover guys, but directors Which as well. Is. He's incredible. And uh, so he and I were kind of like the bad kids of, you know, we, we never did anything massively wrong, but we would pass notes to each other. <laughs> if we weren't, if we weren't actually recording, we would pass little notes to each other about what was going on. But it was, it was so fun. Julie Dees was another Smurfling and uh, Noelle North was also one. So they brought in the four, the four Smurflings. And uh, I think they recognized fairly soon that we weren't going to let them down, <laughs> which was really good. And uh, so, uh, and and my my greatest day on it was they had an episode in which Snappy, I think, eats part of a mushroom or something that Gargamel has left there and grows really huge and angry. And, and so I had to do the voice not only regularly, but also make him quite large in the process, uh, all throughout, just so switching back and forth, you know, and, uh, afterwards I, you know, was coming out of the room thinking, boy, that was, that was in interesting, you know, and, uh, June Foray walked up to me and tapped me on the shoulder. She said, pretty good kid. Pretty good. That was all I needed to hear. That was it. That was it. My, you know, my life was made at that point. So. She was wonderful. Very cool. And I do I do want to talk about, like, you know, like, memories of doing, again, like I said it earlier, it was probably the greatest Scooby-Doo movie of all time. Scooby and Doo and the Cool School, where you played Elsa Frankenstein. And I loved your role in this. Like, I, it, to like, and I'll tell you what I told Sue, like, when I had her on here. Uh, every Halloween tradition uh, since I was seven, uh, I would always watch, because Cartoon Network would always run Cartoon Network's Cartoon Theater, and Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School would be a recurring thing that would happen every year. I would watch that movie every year because I was such a huge fan of that movie. I hate to tell you, people still do. I mean, uh, of my whole voice career, I would tend to say there's just a few things that really stand out and have totally held up to this day. And one of them is the character of Elsa Frankenteen. She was Frankenteen because we were teenagers, right? And uh, and so that's one of the ones that people still, and I think you mentioned in when you first contacted me that you knew that OKKO OK brought us back, yep. brought us all back, uh, Rusi and uh, Susan and myself to revoice the characters for for that, which was, it's just unbelievably fun. It was really fun. Um, so uh, 
yeah, I I had no idea that it was as popular as it was. I know that it was just a, a ton of fun to do, you know. Now, uh, because, and I know this is too, like you came back, Rusi came back, Sue came back. Uh, unfortunately, Marilyn Schleffer passed away, but what, why didn't they bring back Patty Maloney for Tannis? You know, I don't have the slightest idea. Um, they just, they called us in, and this was, thank God, when Rusi was still with us. Um, that was another big shock because I felt like I had just seen her. You know, I had gotten her phone number. We were going to get together. We hadn't seen each other in so long. And it was just a delight to see her. And um, then I just, I heard the news uh, that she'd just passed away in her sleep. I, and in a way, because of Wayne Allwine, her husband who had predeceased her, who was the voice of Mickey Mouse. And as Minnie, she had met him playing Minnie while he was playing Mickey. And they fell in love and got married, which I always am just like blown away by that story. Um, story. I think she went to be with Wayne, you know? She missed him terribly and I think she just went to be with him, which was wonderful. Um, the actual recording of it was just, it was just so fun. And it was another fun thing that we did at Hanna-Barbera. I mean, uh, you know, back in those days, and I'm sure everyone that you've interviewed has told you this, we all recorded in the same room together at the same time. Yes. Um, now it's pretty much, unfortunately, not like that. They don't, uh, they don't bring in the whole cast to read. I wish they would because you get some amazing stuff when you're doing the back and forth because even with somebody reading the script to you it's a different different feeling but when you get other people in there when you get and i like the full cast situation because that way you get to you get to see what everybody's going to do and you kind of adjust and have fun with everybody like very, that very yeah. cool and i uh love that movie and uh what, what about working with um ruda lee who played revolta in the movie um you know once again, when you went into these big, huge things, you would just delight. And I think Andrea pointed out to me one time, she said, what's so wonderful for me about directing these things is watching you all have the same kind of energy as the person who's actually speaking at the moment. You know, you want each other to get it so well, you know, so... I met Ruta Lee, we said hi, it was very pleasant, but in terms of really getting to know each other, and of course I loved her performance. I mean, everybody's performance in those things was top notch and and you would kind of be there supporting each other. Nobody wanted anybody to, you know, have a problem. And if there was some line, somebody was stumbling over, uh, people would make light of it rather than, trying to hold you up as like, oh my God, you're making a mistake. You know, that didn't happen. Everybody was just like, you know, I remember there was a thing we would say from Wizard of Oz, where we'd go, oil can, oil can, just like the Tin Woodman, because <laughs> that meant, you know, you're not getting it, but you will, right? So it was fun. And it was also an all-star cast too. You had you had Hamilton Camp that was in it. You had Casey Kasem that was in it. Um, I can't pronounce. I always have a problem pronouncing his last name, but his first name is Renee and sort of Yes. Yeah, wonderful guy. It, he and I and Hamilton were all at the same agency, and I ended up uh, and have and I'm still doing improvisation for over thirty-five years. I ended up first with Sills and Company, which Hamilton was a member of. And then Hamilton, when that company went to New York, when they came back, they hired us as new replacements for improvisational theater of Sills and Company. We got to study with Viola Spolin herself, who created all the improvisational games for the theater. Uh, if you ever want to know about improv, you look her up because it's from her that everything has come. But uh, Hammy and I, um, he split off and did a little separate group after that and i was in that group with him and we were we were very close friends hamid uh, I mean, yeah. and, and you guys got to work together again in ducktales when he was gizmo duck and you were bully beagle yes exactly <laughs> boy talk about doing your homework pal that's uh that's impressive yeah 
Um, yes. And we auditioned a lot together um, and uh, just had a really good time. You know, when you improvise with somebody, it creeps into your work product because there's trust. There's such trust there that you can go back and forth and back and forth and, and bring stuff to the table that you normally wouldn't, you know, so very right. fun. Did you have a favorite uh, scene or line from Elsa Frankenstein? Oh Lord, I should have, I should have re-looked at this. I don't think so. I think it was just kind of her, her overall attitude and the low, you know, you know, she wasn't particularly bright, but she was there and she was funny. She was very funny. So, you know, just a, just a fun thing to do. And, and of course her have her being Frankenstein's daughter was <laughs> something that you could have such fun with as well. Right? I agree. And, um, it, and we've talked about, okay, KO reprising the characters. Uh, what was your memories doing, uh, that, that show and bring it back to well, it, it was really wonderful because it came out of nowhere. Um, and uh, I get the call from my agent saying, you know, they, they're bringing you guys back to do, to do the characters that you did at Hanna-Barbera. And I was like, whoa, really? <laughs> said, yes. So we went in and the wonderful part of it was they were all so like blown away that we were there. We were just thrilled, you know, to be there. And uh, it was just, as you know, just uh, Rusi and Susan and, and, and myself. And uh, we were just sitting out in the lobby, just having a blast when they came out and said, okay, time to come in. And uh, they let us, they let, uh, they let me, they let them, if they wanted to, um, just kind of throw in lines as how the character would speak at the end. So I was able to come in with a bunch of different little uh rejoinders that you know some of which they use some of which they don't but it it always just helps to enrich the moment and whatever you're doing and that's what they did and they were so thrilled to see us again i had no idea that it was as popular as it was um until i went to do that and then they went oh my gosh you don't know you don't know <laughs> every halloween you guys don't get it this is like legendary and we were just like whoa really so it was great it was really fun. God, you, you, you'll be proud of me. I actually own a copy of the Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School on DVD. Get out of here. Oh, yeah. great. I'll, actually, I'll send you a picture like, uh, like of it like well, after this interview, though. Like That, I actually own Duckman, the whole complete box se season on DVD, too. That's That was just wonderful. Um, gosh, what a great experience that was. Um, Duckman was so out there and and so unlike anything else i'd done you know at that point um because not only were my characters constantly being destroyed and brought back but um i got to work with just you know absolutely brilliant people eg daly uh was wonderful nancy uh, travis nancy travis jason alexander now they didn't this was oh dweezil zappa dweezil zappa as ajax that's right Weasel Zappa was there. And then, of course, Tim. Dana, Dana Hill was there, too. God rest her soul. I still miss her. Like, I, I was a, that was a real tough one for me because uh, she had called me that weekend and uh, said, you know, can we get together? And uh, I said, you know, I, I got the message like late in the day for some reason. And so I thought, oh, it'll be too late to call her back tonight. So, uh, and this was before the massive texting took over. But um, uh, so I called her, uh, I think the following day and she didn't pick up and I just left her a message and said, hey, whatever you, you know, whenever you want to get together, let's do it. Do I have lunch? Do I have dinner? What do you want to do? And then I didn't hear back. And then Monday morning I heard that you know, she had passed away. Um, she was just the spunkiest, funnest, brightest little gal you'd ever want to meet, you know? And she had that voice. I mean, that was her voice, you know? She was real spunky like this. Oh, you know, just, that was how she talked. And, and uh, yeah, she was, she was lovely and wonderful. And then after she passed away, 
they asked me if I would jump in and do uh, Charles. Do Charles, yeah. So I finished out the season for her as Charles. I went to the hospital. Um, she hadn't she hadn't quite died yet. I went to the hospital when I heard she was there, and her her dad was in the room with her. And I just said, you know, um, someone has let my dogs in the room. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they're in here. Um, she was in the room and, and I just said to her dad, you know, they've asked me to take over this. And he said, well, I know Dana would would love that, you know. So I did get to say goodbye to her, which was really nice. I think it's very cool too. Like you got to carry uh, her legacy now, like as you know, and the honor of, you know, you know, facing her, uh, you know, taking over her character and stepping in for duties as Charles. Because when I first saw the episode Ajax, Ajaxer, this was the episode where you first made your debut as Charles, where you, this was the first episode. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, seven years old, why does Charles sound so different? And then at the end of the episode, I see them the in love and memory to Dana Hill. And I'm like, my, my eyes, like, got almost watery. Like, there's two times that I, you know, like when I was younger that I uh, teared up when I saw a voice actor pass away. Dana Hill's one of them. And then, of course, Phil Hartman. Oh, Lord, what a day that was. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I was recording at Buzzy's studio that day. And my friend Lynn, we, uh, Lynn Marie Stewart, who played Miss Yvonne on Pee Wee's Playhouse, um, still one of my best pals to this day, had been supposed to go over and have uh, been supposed to meet up with Bryn that day. And so when I saw this on the news, I was in the I was in the uh, lobby. Uh, the room at actually not the lobby, but they had like a green room at Buzzy's where you could go and and uh, they had the TV on and I saw this and I thought, what in the name? I couldn't believe it. And so I called Lynn and she was just a mess. She just said, you know, I was supposed to meet meet with Bryn and have dinner with her. So it's weird, you know, it's weird how how all those things worked out. And yes, Phil Hartman was a giant loss. It, it oh. was and. And with Dana Hill, though, like, I mean, you did a phenomenal job, like, you know, do replacing, I mean, like, not replacing, but, you know, carry on the voice of Charles, because, um, you know, God rest uh, Dana Hill's, you know, soul, she was one of the best, like, you know, like, like, you know, like you, I grew up idolizing, you know, her, like, if there was a, you know, a Mount Rushmore of, like, the top 10 voice actors at all time, of course, you were in that for me, and so would be Dana Hill and Sue Blue. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, and I'm honored to even have you mention my name. It was a, it was kind of an upsetting, scary thing to take on initially um, because I knew I wouldn't be able to sound exactly like Dana, uh, but I hoped I gave enough of what I was able to bring forth as Dana's voice to Charles. Um, and for me, it was, like you said, like a tribute to her, you know, just because I didn't want the character to go away. Nobody wanted the character to go away, um, so so it was good and it was it was an honor and ultimately I'm thrilled that I did it. At the time, I was a nervous little bit of a nervous wreck doing it, but but I just kept saying to myself, "This is for her," so you know. And uh, I you know it's very cool. And before you know, I have more Doctor Man questions, but I do want to say something like that. It's very interesting you said that you like you know you were trying to like sound like her but it's it's, it's interesting you said that because i recently binge watched the, the adventures of gummy bear where you did ursa gummy and at first i thought it was dana hill talk and it inter and ironically you you played her you played uh the big sister like since it was ursa and then there was buddy and buddy was played by dana hill and when i first heard ursa i thought it was dana hill like i mean i didn't know it was you until i did research that's that's wow you're very prepared um yes Ursa was one of the first roles I did where I said to myself, I am hurting my throat. <laughs> I a have voice, to, right? I, pardon me? You had a, a gruff voice, right? I did. Yeah, very gruff voice. And it's one of those lessons you learn uh, because I auditioned. You know, they said, well, she's, you know, big and strong and she's, you know. And so I had to bring that to the character because it's what I auditioned with. And it was what they wanted when I showed up to do the job after I got it, which was great. But every time after those sessions, oh my gosh, hot tea and lemon and honey and 
fishermen's friends, which all voiceover actors keep in their back pocket or used to, all of those things I would have to use. And that for the rest of the day, I mean, I'd get home and I would just go, not talking. I'm not talking. I don't have anything left for you today. So, yeah. Here's a, uh, here's a question I asked to, because uh, I had Roger Bumpus on here, who was the voice of Squidward Technicals. Yes. I, and he, you know, talked about how he, like, when doing voice acting, he loves to scream. I want to get your opinion on, like, when you have a role and you're required to scream as part of the character, with, like Fluffy and Uranus when they get killed. Yeah. Um, what I would usually do is, and a lot of actors I know do this, save that till the end of the recording. Uh, as you're going through it and doing the full recording, when you come on something that's that big and loud and it's really fun to do. Don't get me wrong. I agree with Roger on that particular point, but uh, I would like to save that till the end so that I can really give it my all and, you know, not run out of steam. You know, these are the things you learn as you go through and you do recording sessions and suddenly you find, wait, whoa, what's happened to that register? What, why'd that go away? And uh, so I would always just save it until the end and then, and they were great about it. You know, they were like, oh yeah, sure. Let's, let's save it till the end. In fact, they would suggest it most times, you know, let's wait till the end and we'll come in and fill in when we do the redos of lines that they would want to do, you know. I see. And uh, from what I read online, I want to confirm this by you, but it said online, there was an online report that said that you based Fluffy and Uranus's voice, Fluffy for a Southern type girl. And then Uranus was more like a Marilyn Monroe type. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I can't, I, I'm not clear on whether there was anything Southern about Fluffy, but, uh, I know Uranus had more of the Marilyn, you know, this sort of thing. Well, Fluffy was more up in this area, you know? So it's the same part actually of your voice. It's the same part of the mask of your face that you're using, but you, you add air for Marilyn. And then the other one is just more, you know, like that. So, uh, yeah, I guess so. I guess, did I say Southern? I probably did. I don't know. That was a long time ago. But uh, they were two of my really favorite characters to do. Mine too. And you know what? This is, this is, why, this is part of, like, many reasons why you are a legend, Pat. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, definitely you part of my childhood and any other 90s uh, kids childhood and I d another 90s movie that I do want to ask you about was your memories as Tony in American Tales uh, okay this is probably one of my top flight favorite stories of all time okay because when the call came out um, f to, to do Tony to Pony uh, they just basically said Steven Spielberg and Don Bluth are looking for a little New York boy, right? <clears throat> so they had us do recordings at home. They just had us put something on cassette and send back then it was cassette and send the cassette in. And uh, there was a little kid in our neighborhood when I grew up whose family, uh, they didn't live there very long, but they were Italian and they were from back East. So he had that New York sound, right? And uh, he, uh, you know, he was just a riot. He was so funny. Hey, could I have a cigarette? You know, come on, give me one of those. Give me a cigarette. I want a cigarette. And I would be like, You're, what are you, four? No, go away. What are you talking about? <laughs> and, uh, but he was a little feisty guy, but funny and, and full of heart, you know? And I would always... Talk about my mama. My mama makes the best pasta anywhere. You know, he he was just, it was great. So I just thought, oh, I'm just going to do that. Because he's the most, you know, the thing I can think of that's the most relatable. He was from New York City. He was Italian. I mean, you know. And I sent the tape in. So I get the part. I'm like, thank God. This is fabulous. You know. I show up for the recording. And Don Bluth says to me. Pat, I got a funny story to tell you. I said, what? He said, well, Steven Spielberg wants to meet you. I went, he does? He said, kind of. He wants to meet the little kid. 
I said, oh boy. I said, well, obviously that isn't going to happen. Doesn't he want to meet me? He said, he said, no, no, he just loved your tape. And it was so real to him that he just wanted to meet that little boy because he thought he might use him in one of his films. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, but it was really fun. And, and Don Bluth was great because he, uh, as we were recording, he videotaped us so that any gestures or facial things or anything we used, he would then incorporate into the animation of the character, hmm. which I thought was really great. So smart. What a wonderful thing to do, right? Yeah, he was a great, great guy. I just, I loved Don Booth. He was excellent. Yeah, okay. and that that movie was so uh, another kind of, classic. yeah. It is. It is a classic. And uh, and people today, it's even more popular today, I think, because of the immigration situation. You know, it's kind of come come back. I've had, uh, I've had people in social media ask me about it. And, you know, did I, what did I f feel about immigration? And how was I, how do I react to all of that, you know, since this had been done so long ago in this movie? And it was a very special film, you know. Very cool. And now I do want to ask too, because, um, cause I've had, you know, f three, uh, former Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle alumni on the show. Uh, I had Renee Jacobs, Townshead Coleman and Cam Clock. You of course were on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as Mona Lisa in Raphael meets his match. Memories of working on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. And of course the cast members. Oh boy. Well, first of all, Rob Paulson, talk about a legend, you know, even went back to play it when my daughter did the next one of the next incarnations of of turtles uh where she played april and she was kind of having a love thing with Raphael at that time right uh in this in the story but um yeah all these people were so good that and you know my thing playing Mona Lisa was great because initially they were going to make her a turtle and then they decided no 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 boys won't like having a girl turtle this was a lot of the talk back then you know the boys who are fond of the mutant turtles won't like you know so they kind of made her a sort of a lizardy character yeah <laughs> but it was super fun and and of course the love of her thing and people still post they still post those scenes between between me and and Rafe you know uh um it was you know super fun and Susan Blue directing right yeah it's true so there you go I mean you, you can't you can't really ask Charity James I believe was on that show um, um and Barry Barry Gordon Barry Gordon yeah yeah he was on that show uh Pete Renaday that's right. That's right. You, you've got, you remember more names better than I do, but, but Rob is still, I mean, he's got his wonderful thing that he does where he goes all over the place and interviews all kinds of people. And he actually did a wonderful interview with May and me together, my daughter, May Whitman and, and me together. And because we had both done voice work. So that was very fun. You know what's cool though, like because you mentioned May, because I, you know, I loved her work on Johnny Bravo as Little Susie. But it's interesting because you played the adult version of uh, Susie in one episode. It was so it was cool to see the mother and daughter team uh, as the same character but in different ages. Exactly, and you know she was very young when she did that. She was maybe five years old, four or five years old, and uh, when we read for Van Partible. And she got in there to read for little Susie for Van Partible. Um, you know, he was kidding around. Van's such a great guy. I mean, he, this is the creator of, of Johnny Bravo. And uh, he's such a great guy, such a nice man and such a funny man. And so kind and easy, you know. And here is my daughter, you know. She had done some work, but nothing this big at this point. And uh, so she, you know, and... I think it was, was it before she was reading? I think it might've been before she was reading. So, you know, we would say the line to her and then she would just say it and make it her own and blah, 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 right? Well, then when, <laughs> when, we, when we finished, 
Van went, so will you do the part for me, May? Will you do it? And she was like, you mean you're going to give it to me now? You're not going to make me wait? <laughs> <laughs> and here later, you're giving it to me right now? Her eyes were just like saucers, you know? And so, yeah, when they called me in to play little Susie grown up, of course, it was super fun. You know? Very cool. And I just want to say, though, this was also another accolade you could put to Pat for you because not ever like i mean unless i'm wrong here we never really had a you know mother or daughter that were both voice a actresses and not only just voice actors but known voice actors and have done many big projects yeah yeah i know uh she also worked on wild thornberries if i remember that correctly for klasky chupo um and i had worked on rugrats and yes. that and uh so so that was fun too because lots of times she would come to my sessions you know when she was little so she really saw how it how it all worked and uh so then by the time she got in there to do it herself it was pretty great you know right. and yeah i guess there aren't i hadn't no. thought of, really thought about that there's, there's father daughter but never once mother and daughter because father and daughter because of paul winchell and april winchell that's right but never have I ever seen a mother-daughter like voice acting duo. Right, exactly. We had um, what was the other one? That was another one that that she and I. Oh, I know. It was on Avatar. Um, they brought me in to play Katara's mother uh, later on at one point. So the kid's been good. You know, she's she's helped me, uh, which has been really nice. Uh, we don't often get get to share the mic with each other but when we do it's really special and like i said you both like you know are both two voice acting legends and at least in my eyes you know i, I grew up idolizing both of you like you know as far as voice acting wise like i think you two are the best you mentioned also rugrats so and this is what's going to be one of my next questions too um what was the memories i'm working on all grown up in rugrats as harold frumpkin and also working with cheryl chase uh, Cheryl was wonderful. She was so, I mean, the Angelica just sprang from her, right? She just had that wonderful little compartmentalized bratty pocket that she would jump into for Angelica, which was so funny. And Harold was great because he was just her sycophant. I mean, he followed her. He adored her. He just, she could do no wrong. And uh, it was an opportunity to use a, use a lisp, you know, because Harold always had a lisp. And he would follow around and Angelica was everything. And then when we, you know, they brought him up to teenage uh, years briefly. And uh, so then I got, I got to sort of do him more like a teenager, but he still had the lisp, right? So... It's very fun when you get to change age, ages in a voice, you know, that that makes a big difference. I remember Susan directing me and saying, Pex, honey, think Pex, when you'd have to do a, an older boy's voice. So that was fun. Yeah, I, I mean, I I love the Rugrats. I mean, I think it was cool, like, uh, that, you know, Angelica had, like, you know, some uh, a boy that actually had a, I mean, would you say it's safe to say that he had a crush on her? Oh, put it, are you kidding? Yes, totally, completely, uh, it, you know, head over heels for her. Plus, Charlie Adler directing, which is just heaven on toast. He's so funny and so good and so fast and just keeps it moving. Cree Summer, who is also one of my dearest friends. Um, Very strong. Yes. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, you, you had all these wonderful, wonderful people that you got to work with. Now, they wouldn't, these were scenes, they tried to put you with the actual actor in the, in the scene you'd be with, but you wouldn't be with, like, the total cast. Like, we, we didn't work with the adults very much then. Uh, it was mostly just us kids. So that was really great. I see. And I do want to ask this question because um, as a, you know, as a longtime veteran voice actress, I'm sorry, legend, because you are a legend because you have worked on so many projects that you definitely uh, deserve the title and earned the title of legend. Um, I do want to ask you about like 
uh, regardless, like voice, uh, like voice acting itself, though, because I remember an auto commentary one time for the Simpsons episode where Kurt Douglas guest starred, and he talked about how he didn't like using the headsets, like the headphones, to record. I wanted to get your opinion on using uh, headphones to record. A lot of people don't, um, because I think I started out with them. Uh, for me, it's comforting somehow. A lot of people feels it shuts them off, and I think for people who do a lot of on-camera acting, that's kind of how they feel because they don't, they feel like that cuts them off from their, their fellow actors. I never, I never really got that because most everybody wore cans in the day when I, when we'd work. So it wasn't so much, but some people like, for example, some people sit, some people sit, you know, sit when they record and, you know, work on their script then. And then some people have to stand the whole time. They have to stand in order to get the energy up because cartoons are very energetic, <laughs> you know? I definitely got to ask you too, like when you have a, a role that you have to play what, and you see like the character, what motivates you like into doing it? Like what, like what pro, like motivates you into doing like a voice for Fluffy and Uranus or Harold or even Elsa? Um, I guess the picture the picture of the character is always good to have because if I see a little something in their eyes or their mouth or the way they're, you know, it just depends kind of on how they're drawn. And I like to latch on to a little, a little something that's going to inform the character. You know, if, uh, Elsa Frankentine, you know, she was big, she wore big shoes, everything was, you know, plus, I mean, obviously, with her father being Frankenstein, you're not going to have a light little flighty voice for, for that. Uh, and, you know, there was just, there was always something that kind of informed it for me. Fluffy and Uranus obviously were the, almost the same characters, but had to be different which is why I used the head voice and then added air, basically, <laughs> to make the other one. It was basically the same voice. There's one episode uh, in Duckman that was my favorite, which I had to cuss out. I remember that one. It was um, Forbidden Fruit. There we go. The funny part of that was that when I went to do it, I said, well, should I, what should I do? Should I just use other words they go oh no 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 you go for it you go for it you use the absolute worst words you can think of and i was like really they said oh yeah we're just going to take them out we'll bleep them out you just do and so i just went for it i went for it and used every expletive i could possibly come up with f bombs s bombs you name it i threw them in there and uh when I finished, I looked up and they were all like dying. They were laughing so hard. People collapsed over their desks and just howling, laughing. But it was so freeing. I mean, to be able to just do that and be recorded like that was really, really fun. And it was so funny too because that scene, when you did that scene though, it actually, before it went to commercial breaks that episode, uh, uh, Uranus ended the whole scene with that felt effing good. <laughs> right i got that yes absolutely and it did i mean it did I, you know uh they were they were very innovative class key chupo was very innovative uh and wonderful in in what they did with with characters especially on duckman i duckman to this day i still can't explain and i when i talked to jason alexander i met up with him one time at uh i think one of the one of the parties for for duck man or something and we got to talking and uh i just said i just love what you do so much with the character and he said are you because we had never been in the same room together we had never worked together because he had his on-camera thing so they just had to get him whenever they could right and uh so he said, are you, what are you, a, one of the producers or are you one of the writers or what do you do? And I went, well, I'm Fluffy and Uranus. And he was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> he was really shocked. Uh, but just a, 
a great guy. And, and like I said, these are all people that are so there for you and so ready. I mean, when you go into, there's a difference between on-camera auditions and voiceover auditions, it's my way of thinking. Because there were times when I would be there waiting in the waiting room and somebody would come out and they'd go, honey, don't, don't do this. I just did this and they didn't like it, you know, so don't do that. And I just thought to myself, boy, you know, that really wouldn't happen so much in on camera. Uh, the competition would be so, and this was, I don't know, there was kind of a family feeling about being in the voiceover industry then, you know. And you actually are part of like history because, you know, Duckman to this day, whether it's on the USA Network or Car or Comedy Central, people always loved uh, Duckman. In fact, actually it made the IGN's, you know, top 50 show of all time. I got to check which number it ranked, but it definitely made that thing. And I'll, sh I'll show you where, like, after we do the interview, I'll actually send you a link to that because I, I got to show you a couple of other things too. Like, I actually still have a VHS copy of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Raphael Meets His Match at Long Time Fan. That, yeah, you really are. I'm, I'm massively impressed. I mean, Susan told me when I called her and I said, Hey, you know, this wonderful Petey guy, what's going on there? And she just said, honey, you're going to feel so good because he's so knowledgeable. Way do you do it? It's really going to be fun. So. And, and like, you know, this is, uh, I definitely have to say this too. You know, like the old saying, I feel like a kid in a candy store. No, I feel more like that kid at Blockbuster Video renting like some of the, these classic cartoons that you both were part of. Oh my gosh. That's, that's just, you can't, you can't buy that. That is, that is amazing. And if you can leave uh, any kind of imprint ever, you know, and with anybody who really enjoys what they're doing. Plus, as I said, we, I just worked for, Gordon Hunt, I mean, the first director. Oh, Lord. Yeah, Helen Hunt's father? Helen Hunt's father. And he was also in Dilbert as Wally. Correct. Uh, Gordon was an amazing director. And, uh, and f you know, as a director and voiceover, you have to know how much you got to keep your actors on track and you got to get the recording session done. But you've also got to let them kind of be wacky in there. You know, because that wackiness contributes to the energy. So when you're in the room with those voice actors, they can do like a million voices. You know, uh, Jeff Bennett, one of, my, one of my good friends. Johnny Bob himself. Yeah. Jeff Bennett, for example, just would go off into, you know, a million voices. Obviously, Frank Welker, same, same, you know. Uh, these guys could do so many different things and they'd start a little conversation, you know, as Elvis and, you know, Gandhi. I mean, <laughs> it was just amazing. And you just sit there just, yes, please. I mean, so fun. So fun. Very cool. And, you know, like, like there, there's so many like your know, project i mean that you've done though like you know duckman was one of them and with duckman i gotta say like i never seen a show like aside from the simpsons that had so many great guest stars you had bob guccione you had tim curry you had uh eugene levy you had um uh joe walsh like so many of these stars like on duckman i, I gotta ask you since you were part of that you know uh like, you know part of that great show like what was it like working with all those you know on uh, big time names you know Usually, I hate to say this, but those big time names came in separately. Oh, even point. Tim Curry? Uh, Tim Curry, I worked on a show with at Hanna-Barbera that was a little interstitial show, a monsters show, right? Monster Tales, it was called. Wait, 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 are you talking about Are Real Monsters? No. Okay. It was Monster Tales. Monster Tales. T-A-I-L-S. I don't even know if it's available now. But Gordon Hunt directed it. I was the only woman on it. It was Jonathan Winters. It was Tim Curry. It was me. And who else? There was somebody else there. This was so long ago. Might have been Don Messick. Um, but it was at Hanna Barbera and it was just it was just unbelievably hysterical. I don't know how Gordon kept us on track at all because these guys were so outrageous. They really were so outrageous and outrageously funny. But when you get a guest star like that, normally, unfortunately, you don't necessarily 
get to record with them because their schedules don't permit them to come and sit for a couple hours, three, four hours in a, in a session. Um, and the way we used to do it was you'd read through the whole thing first, right? And get notes as you read, kind of read through it. Then you'd record, you'd go back and record everything. And then they'd give you direction as you did it, if they didn't like, you know, where the line was going or if they thought it could be a little different. And then at the very end, they would go back and redo certain lines that the producers, and that's the thing, the director in the booths not only has to keep the actors happy, but they also have to keep all the producers behind them happy. We're all yelling, no, I want this, I want that, you know. And Andrea was brilliant at that, Charlie Adler, Susan, Pat they Fraley. were all, all incredible, huh? Pat Fraley? Pat Fraley, yeah, just amazing. I mean, these guys are all kind of stars to me, you know, because they were all just capable of so many different things. You know, it was it was truly remarkable. Very cool. And, you know, um, I do want to get, you know, your opinion on because Duckman ended on a very uh, interesting cliffhanger where it was King Chicken marrying Bernice. You had uh, Corn Fed marrying Beverly. You had Duckman marrying Honey. And then at the end of the episode, you find out that Beatrice was alive this entire time and Corn Fed knew all about it. What yeah. do you think was going to happen? Like, since we don't know, like, the... What, what was going to happen next because it ended on a cliffhanger. What did you think was going to, what do you think you, you thought was going to happen at the end? I always thought that Corn Fed and Beatrice would maybe, you know, run off together. <laughs> I mean, Greg Berger, who did Corn Fed, who has the deepest, most wonderful voice. And Greg and I actually were in a Neil Simon uh, uh, show together called God's Favorite, where we played a set of twins whose like added IQ was 120. I mean, we were, there's a lot of this, you know, we weren't very bright, either one of us, um, but we played and, and he's from St. Louis, I'm from St. Louis. We've, you know, and we're both at the same agency forever and ever. So yeah, I loved him. And Nancy Travis was fabulous too. I mean, you know, so I always kind of pictured, well, they're gonna, they're gonna end up together. That was my thing. I see. <laughs> And I do want to ask, Sue, because I know some one episode where you get to hear Grandmama's side, like where she comes from and her origins, where it was like little, like it was like in Russia. Like, I got to get your uh, thoughts on this one, because you're playing Charles and you're playing Fluffy and Uranus uh, right now. Um, but now you have to put on the Russian accent. Is it hard to like, you know, add on to like in voice acting in general, like where you have to like theoretically, if you have. Uh, Charles, in like that, he has to play like a Luth Lithuanian or a Russian like person. Like, is it hard to add on like the accent like of an established character? You have to. Uh, it, fortunately, they send you the scripts ahead of time, uh, so you can kind of take a look for something like that. <clears throat> so, if I have to work with a, a Russian or Lithuanian or Slavic accent, you know, I'll have time to do that. So you renew the accent, first of all, at least I do in my brain. I renew the accent, I set the accent, I get a little phrase sometimes that helped me, would help me key into that accent. And then you do the voice you do for the character and then you just kind of blend them together. And that's what I would do and I, I would do. A lot of people I know don't do anything with the script ahead of time. They just do it right when they get there. There's a lot to be said for that as well because of the improvisational nature of things. But I like to have a little handle on what's gonna, what's coming up, especially if they're gonna make me change accents. And, and since I was doing three characters uh, in the show, you know, I'd like to prepare a little bit for that. I see. And um, you, you worked with many companies, you know, throughout the entire, you know, years of voice acting. You worked with, like you said, Hanna-Barbera. You worked with Disney. You worked with Nickelodeon and um, and I, I believe Warner Brothers, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. was, was there a difference between each, like the way each uh, company would have, you know, like each, like just in general working for each company? Was there any difference between them? Not really. Um there was a little more, let's put it this way, Klasky Chupo was a smaller, uh, more wonderful family kind of affair. But 
really when it came down to working for studios or you know something like and nick too kind of more of a family situation um but basically a really i have to say it it revolved around the director because the director creates the space for you you know the director the director provides the freedom for the actor and encourages the actor so it doesn't come so much about you know what studio it is or what area you're in or what's you know the the director's going to create the safe space for you to to play in and then your fellow players that's it you know and um uh, and can I tell you something like that happened like in high school though? Cause like, Al, I got an interview with Billy West. This is way before I started my show, like long way, but like, I was 19 years old. I actually, for a career, like for English class, we had to choose a career and with no hesitation, I said, I want to be a voice actor. And I, my career counselor at the time uh, actually arranged for a, 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 like a phone interview with Billy West. Like I got to do interview Billy West. So she contacted his publicist and then I got to interview him four years later because my friend had a podcast. So I got to interview him a second time. So wow. after that, I'm sorry. I said, wow. And then after that one, I was like, I want to, I wanna, this is so much fun. Like I want to do like, you know, inter, like interviewing and I want to do like, you know, like type of thing, like interview people I grew up, you know, watching as a kid and just idolize. And I idolized you. I idolized May. I, I idolized a lot of, you can name, I can name you 30 voice actors and actresses that I just, Grew up online, Billy West, Rob Paulson, Brian Cummins, Jim Cummins, all those like names, like um, Tress McNeil. Um, I, I always thought like, Pat, like, you know, you are in the caliber of like, you know, like June Foray, Lucille Bliss, Tress McNeil, oh. Sue Bliss. Oh, no, no, you're very kind. Uh, they, they really, to me, they're to me like what you're talking about now. You know what I mean? And, and I adore Tress. Tress is, Tress is a genius. She's basically just a genius. That's all. Um, Billy is so funny and so hilarious. We did uh, the Ghostbusters, Extreme Ghostbusters together. He was a uh, Slimer. And I was Janine Melnitz on that show. And uh, Susan directed it. And those were, uh, we had evening sessions, which was uh, very unusual. Normally you record during the day. But uh, Everybody who was on that show was so good and so busy that the only time that everybody could get together was in the evening. So, you know, they'd have like little sandwiches for us and things like that. And you'd come in and you had this, this great evening show to do. And, and, uh, Mo LaMarche, uh, Mauricio. Oh, I'm, I love Maurice. Isn't he great? I mean, Maurice is just amazing. He, uh, still to this day you know do you know the story about him and him getting brain the voice of brain i know that he bases that voice on orson wells i don't know much about it oh my gosh well there's an orson wells tape i don't know if you've ever oh, heard with it. The fish sticks one yeah i saw it that and mrs mrs something's buttery something brown bread or peas or something Rosen it's something fish. ridiculous where he ends up just storming out of the session, right? Furious at the, the stupid words they're making him say. It's a very famous piece of, of voiceover, uh, ephemera. You should look it up and listen to it because it's hilarious if you've never heard it. Anyway, it made the rounds when we were all uh, doing things and uh, working. And Mo heard it and he decided that he could do Orson Welles' voice, which he had been working on and was so good at it. So when he went in to read for Brain, um, originally the uh, direction had been like Urkel, you know, kind of this high kind of, you know, nerdy kind of thing, right? And he came in and I guess, I'm not sure if Rob was there at that time, if they had him reading together, I don't know, but whoever he was talking to, he started talking as Orson Welles to show them what he'd been doing, how he'd been working on this Orson Welles voice. And they cut right in and said, what if you did that? What if you did that for Brain? And the rest is history, right? Because, yeah, I know. Amazing. Amazing. 
I mean, there, like some of these names like we just talked about, like Charlie Adler, I loved him growing up on Rocco's Modern Life, Coward Chicken. He was, you know, like he can also like like you run the gamut though. Like he can go high like cow, tough like chicken, and then feminine like red guy or Mr. Big Head. Like yes. It, yes. so cool. Um and there's some, there's other names too, like you know, they're really good and so underrated, but I just don't hear much from them anymore. Like Danny Mann is another one. Danny Mann. Okay, so here's the funny news. I've been in an improv group with Danny Mann for over 35 years. So I just saw him yesterday. Nope, Wednesday. Online. We're Zooming our improv <laughs> right now. So he's in my group. Um, Gail Mathias is my best friend. She's on Bobby's World. She played the mom on Bobby's World. She was also in the uh, Tiny Toons. She was in Tiny Toons. Um, and a bunch of other voice stuff that she did. Um, and she's in my group. It's interesting. We all kind of hang on together and ended up working together, you know, which is great. Very cool. And like, like so many names, I'm sorry, what were we gonna say? Nothing, oh. nothing. No, just, I was just saying, you know, it's fun to be able to uh, pass that creativity on over into another art form on stage. I mean, we haven't been able to be on stage you know, with all of this going on, but uh, with the quarantine, but um, we've still kept going on Zoom, which is great. You guys are, you know, the best though, because like, you know, there's names too, like, you know, like, like Jack Angels, Michael Bell, as you mentioned, because I love Michael Bell. I love Jack Angels. Tito, I, he was on Bobby's World. I don't know how, what's his last name? Tito Insana. 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 No, Tino oh. Insana. Great. Uh, yeah. T-I-N-O, Tino Insano was wonderful. He's no longer with us either. Exactly. Yeah, but but Tino was great. I love Tino because whenever he'd see me, he'd go, hey, baby, you want to ride around in my Cadillac? I mean, he just, you know, that kind of wonderful, open, fun kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, Pat, you also worked on, with Tim Curry, The Pebble and the Penguin. What were your memories of doing that movie? Uh, it was a Don Bluth, so it was super fun. Uh, Don Bluth always made everything super fun. Uh, I do remember going in to do the singing on it, and Barry Manilow was directing the singing. The sing the singer? Yes, Barry Manilow was di directing the singing, and because I sing, so it was you know, I, and I. The only thing about singing is when you sing in character, you want to still maintain the character you know um so if i recall correctly i think the character i did was kind of valley girl like and when i came in and started to do this barry manilow cut in and said uh excuse me darling excuse me and i was like yes and he said don't do that accent <laughs> now we had already recorded the character. So, you know, she's like, I'm oh, in. That had already been done and already been recorded. And he was like, don't do that accent because later on, no one's going to like that accent. <laughs> That's going to pass from popularity. And I thought, how am I going to get through this one? Right. So I just kind of continued to give the flavor of the accent as I went through it. And hoped that in pickups somebody would say something but he kind of he kind of did that whole session as a result not that crazy about Barry Manilow <laughs> <laughs> not that fond of him you know <laughs> oh Mandy no mm -mm, not so much Coca Cabana <laughs> yeah sorry not there not involved no mm -mm. Now, I do want to ask, though, because you mentioned that, you know, Sue Blue is a voice uh, acting director, and as well as Charlie um, and Pat mm -hmm. Fairley. Are there any differences between the two uh, directors? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're all different. I mean, Susan directed me in The Tick, too. The Tick is absolutely, hands down, another one of my very favorite. It's right up there with Duckman, because it was so strange and wonderful. And... Townie was so great in that. I love uh, Townsend Coleman. I had him on the show. He's a great man. Oh, just just brilliant. And and uh, originally, uh, Arthur, the sidekick, the moth, was played was voiced by Mickey Dolenz, who was in the Monkees. Oh, wow! Did you know that he oh, was? I know that. 
He was the original voice of Arthur. And then I'm not sure what happened. He was maybe just not available, had stuff to do. So uh, they hired Rob Paulson and, and Rob came in and finished up as Arthur, which, you know, made it absolutely brilliant. And he and Townie were hilarious. And there were all these wacky, wacky, and I loved my, I had two parts in that, that I loved. I loved Sally Vacuum, the newscaster, because she was just, she would hit absolutely every single syllable that she could, you know, and the characters were so wild. Ben Edlund was just brilliant uh, with the stuff he came up with for The Tick. And uh, and then I played the human bullet's wife. I played the bee twins who, you know, everything they said was like bees humming when they talk, you know. You got to be like super creative when you, when you did these way far out characters, you know, and... Uh, Susan was great in terms of directing of that too. Really fun. Very cool. And, you know, I do want to get, you know, your thoughts on working on two other uh, projects you've done. And that is, uh, you worked on Darkwing Duck, which is one of my favorite shows. Like you appeared in, uh, you know, a couple episodes from what I've seen like, online. And you also have appeared in Batman as Martha Wayne. Right. Um, exactly. Memories of doing those two. Uh I love doing, I mean, Martha Wayne, not a huge role, but really fun. Obviously, just to be involved in Batman, really fun. And that was Andrea Romano directing that for Warner Brothers. Uh, Andrea is such an amazing director. I mean, um, she, <laughs> she lets you kind of find it. And then once you've got it, it's cool. But if you don't get there, then she'll help you. Because I would just say to her, give me a line reading. <laughs> <laughs> Do me if I'm not finding it, just give me what you want, you know. Um, but yeah, being Martha Wayne, gosh, that's that's history, that's you know, DC Comics. That's you can't ask for more than that, right? No, not at all. Uh, so so really fun, really fun doing that. And then Darkwing Duck, I'm trying to remember, was that Renee Auvergenois? Was I, he? Oh, uh, no, Darkwing Duck was uh, Jim Cummins. Jim Cummings, of course, of course. Yeah, Jimmy, uh, boy, talk about being able to do anything. And the interesting part of him uh, was that uh, he worked in a, a video rental store, I think, and, and Susan Blue heard him and Andrea Romano heard him, and they were like, you guys, you should be doing voiceover, you know? And, of course, now he's one of the biggest, biggest stars ever in voiceover. I don't remember what I did on that show. I kept saying to myself, should I look myself up before I do this interview? But I figured you'd know. So, you know, you could lead me. Um, but also like, you know, like there's so many like, you know, roles that you've done too. Like, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, the duck, we talked about Duck Man, uh, Dark When Duck. I also want to talk about your time on Duck Tales as Bully Beagle. Memories of doing that show. Uh, always great working for Disney, okay? Always really fun. Um, I'm trying to remember who directed that. It might have been Jamie, uh, but I, um, I, I always just felt like, you know, there, there was a thing that we used to say that uh, women could play boys, could play kids, uh, a little better, because if you had that range, if you were able to drop your voice down and get into that range, you know, like I would say Pex, Susan would say Pex, honey, Pex. And, <clears throat> and then you just envision that character and tap into the emotion of the character. It just tends to come out, you know, and uh, Jimmy Cummings just listening to him. Uh, absolutely wonderful. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I've been so lucky uh, about a year or two ago, I did uh, Lucille Bliss's Grandma Duck. So in a, in a series for DuckTales, I played Grandma Duck. So it was just wonderful to be able, because I had worked with Lucille on Smurfs so many years before. And Lucille really was Smurfly. You know, she was Smurfette. She would come in and she had a little white dress that was flouncy and flirty. And she had long blonde hair and she would wear it, you know, kind of 
pinned up with a thing and she was very feminine and you know just adorable and she had that little you know kind of sweet thing in her voice Aww. and uh yeah so and the first cartoon i think i ever watched as a kid on black and white tv was a cartoon called crusader rabbit and she played crusader rabbit and uh, later on, when I was working with her, I went to her, I went, oh my God, I just looked you up. You played Crusader Rabbit. I loved Crusader Rabbit. So uh, just great. You know, just the opportunity is is magical. I do want to mention, because you did mention Rabbit, though, and, and you appeared in the movie Thumbelina as Mrs. Rabbit. Um, yeah. Memories of doing Thumbelina. Uh, you know, once again, Don Bluth, right? Um, so grateful to him because uh he was really the person that started my movie my movie experience uh doing animation um i had you know i did tv but i had i never thought i would get into uh movie animation that was always like the zenith you know and uh so being able to work with him and being able to be a mama rabbit i had i had read a book called watership down i don't know if you've ever read that book i i haven't but i'm definitely gonna look at that i'm gonna look if that up you like rabbits if you are at all fond of bunnies for any reason watership down is the story of rabbits living underground basically but not like a cutesy story like a real real event and i think if i recall correctly that was one of the things I drew on for that role was the mama rabbit and how she cared for, you know, her babies. Oh, very cool. And, yeah. Um, what about your time working on Atom? Atom. I'm trying to remember. What did I do on Atom? Hmm. I do not recall. I don't recall Atom. I can't remember what I, do you remember what I did on that? Because I have to re-look it up. I just know that, you know, like, um, I can look it up right now though. Like, oh, um, yeah. but Atom was, um, you played, uh, Mama Rousey, Rosie. Oh, I think she was fun. Wasn't she? Yes. <laughs> I think she was, I think she was pretty fun. Anything with a mama in front of it, give it to me. Right. Um, because that gives you the license, you know, that gives you suddenly, I mean, I notice you have a great New York accent, right? <laughs> yes. So it gives you the license to kind of use that maybe a little like the feel of it, if not necessarily, you know, you don't need to go total New York, but you can, you know, the feeling, the feeling of the mama, right? Um, so yeah, Mama Rosie, uh, I, I, I think, like I said, Anytime they give me an opportunity to, and that's the thing, you can go for it. And if they go, well, that wasn't what we were thinking. Of. Oh, well, what were you thinking of? You know, well, we think she comes from Connecticut or Savannah or, you know, Mars. I mean, it, then you just adjust, you keep that same feeling of the character inside you, the same emotion, and then you just adjust you adjust where you're from and and what's important yeah. i agree that, that's like uh, that's um that's the ideology and the, the theory like of like a method actor right yeah exactly i think so yeah absolutely i mean when i when i studied acting that's absolutely was one of the things is to um find and also to find a hook to hang your hat on basically you know, what is it about? Is it that I remember uh, Johnny Depp invents characters from the way he, from the walk. He starts with the walk of the character, right? Okay. He walks. He walks as he thinks the character would walk. And then that's going to create how his head moves and how his arms move and how his body moves. And then all of a sudden he's got an idea. He's got a thing of what it might be, you know. Uh, I think you just find a little hook like that and that enables you to to go forward i see and like with um because you like we mentioned before you worked with so many companies if i uh was extreme ghostbusters filmation i'm trying to remember 
It was Susan directing. I think you might be right about that. I think you could be right about that. I, I recently looked it up because last year, was it last year? It was either last year or the year before. They had a big Ghostbusters giant thing at Sony Studios where anybody who had ever done anything on Ghostbusters came and showed up and there were a lot of tables there with voiceover guys and I don't do that. There were a lot of guys, you know, that just go from con to con and uh, sign autographs and talk with people and hand out pictures and do all that stuff. And it's another great, you know, source of revenue. I don't have, I don't do that, but, but a lot of people do. And this, so there were a lot of guys that were doing that, but there was also the main character. I mean, Danny Aykroyd was there, you know, Bill Murray? Billy, I don't think Billy was there. I don't think he was. There was a big long line, but you cannot believe the amount of people that showed up at this in their cars, decorated as Ecto-1, perfectly decorated, guys dressed as the characters with the packs on their back and the, the things and, you know, people as Slimer, people as, it was mind boggling. Right. And so I was asked to be on the panel for Extreme Ghostbusters, which was very fun to do. Very cool. And with, with Filmation, though, like, um, if they, like, say, like, I wasn't sure if, like, Extreme Ghostbusters was part of the Filmation company, like, but since they're no longer in business, but if they were still in business, would you work for them? Of course. I'd work for anyone. <laughs> you know, there's nobody that you rule out when you do voice work. I mean, unless you've had a terrible experience with someone, but that never, ever happened. Oh, it was okay. always a wonderful, warm, you know, event. I see. And was, um, is it safe to say that Ursa Gummy was the precursor voice for Charles, for Duckman? Uh, the placement is similar, uh, but I never confuse them. Uh, they're all such separate characters to me that I just don't ever, ever confuse them. Snappy, I think, probably was the basis for a lot of the, you know, the little raspy characters. Because he was the first raspy character I ever did. And, uh, but after that, you know, basically they just go off and they become separate people. So I see. Know. And... Uh, I always wanted to ask you this question ever since I was a seven-year-old boy, but Fluffy or Uranus, which, if you had to choose your favorite out of the two, which was your favorite? I can't. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not doable. Once again, totally separate in my mind. Even though they have the same high register bases of sound, they were completely separate. You know, uh, Fluffy more demanding. Uranus, demanding in her own way, but more of a flirt, you know. I mean, they just were, they were completely, you know, Fluffy was feistier, but Uranus was sneakier. But, you know, I mean, just two separates. I could not pick which is better. I loved them both. Okay, and um, if you had to choose your favorite out of the, all the years you've done voice acting, your favorite and least favorite uh, characters you portrayed? Oh, my God. Um, you get the name one for each. Oh my gosh. Let's see. Least favorite only because, not because of the character, but just because of what it did to my voice would be Ursa. Just because that was the tougher one for me to do until I learned that placement. Um, and most favorite. Jiminy Christmas. That's really hard. Um, I'd have to say Fluffy and Uranus are right up there. They really are. Um, but Tony Taponi, too. I mean, that that character. And Snappy. Yeah, I can't. I'm sorry. I tried. It just didn't work. I can't do it. I loved them all. You know. well, they were all, like, legendary characters. Like, I'll always remember to this day, I guess, you know, growing up, watching, like, um, all the, sh the stuff that you've done, though. Like, you know, and... Like, you know, like, before we conclude the interview, Pat, I do, because this is an open forum, and 
Uh, you can talk about or say anything you like. The floor is totally yours now. Oh, my gosh. Um, I miss being able to gather all together in a room. I miss calling the whole cast together, seeing all those people, um, and being able to work with them live in a studio. Uh, those were golden times. And uh, obviously now, you know, everything's over Zoom or online because of the pandemic, which is totally understandable. But even before that, uh, they just didn't do the great big gatherings anymore of an entire cast of people. Because you learn so much from listening to every single person in that cast. Not just your director and not just the characters that you have immediate dialogue with. But, I mean, you're, you're so involved in everybody's creative process when you're all together like that. And for that short period of time, you become this, like, really wonderful private entity where you support each other and laugh with each other and enjoy each other. And uh, I would say that's, that's something I truly miss about this work. Um, but other than that, I'm grateful to have ever done it and to still do it and to still enjoy what I do. Very, very lucky, very lucky. Very cool. And let me just say too, uh, Pat, that, you know, that, you know, not only was this a total honor and pleasure doing this interview, because I've been a fan of your work since I was a seven-year-old little boy, and that was 1997. Like, I mean, unless you want to count 95 when I watched uh, Gummy Bears, but I was a longtime fan, like, you know, worked for years, you and your daughter's work. And I, I said this to Sue Blue, like, uh, one time I said, uh, it's a shame I'm not a doctor or an oil tycoon, because if I was, I would hire both of you as my voice acting coaches. <laughs> You're very sweet. Uh, Susan used to teach. I taught. I taught improv. That's what I have taught because that's become my now my great joy uh, is to play. Uh, I still love obviously doing voice work. It's it's delightful, but I love playing with fellow players and being in a group and um, kind of passing that torch along so that playing the games and improvising never goes away because i think it's the purest most fun part of acting you know yeah i agree and you know like there's so many like you know you know names like out there like you know if i had to name the top 10 you know like female voice actresses you're definitely in there like there's so many the name though i mean like there's you sue blue christine cat the late great christine cavanaugh dana yeah. hill um, E.G. Daly, Tara Strong, Lucille Bliss, June Ferre, Tress, I don't know if I said Tress McNeil, but Tress McNeil, like, there's so many, like, uh, May, May, your daughter May, like, there's so many great voice actresses that, you know, uh, as much as I, you know, idolize, you know, voice actors like Charlie Adler, Billy West, Rob Polson, and Jim Cummins, I can go on and on with the names, but, like, as far as women, though, like, I idolize, you know, I idolize and have so much respect for all of you. Well, thank you so much. Listen, I was really honored that you asked me to do this. So thank you so much. And it's so nice to hear that somebody really values the stuff that you've done over the years. You know, it makes a big difference. Of and and it's nice to be able to know that it's still making a difference. That's that's pretty amazing too. I agree. And you know, there's so many names that hopefully I get to have on one day. I mean, I, I was very honored to have you, Sue, Roger, um, Cam, uh, Townshead, like, there's so many names I, I want to try to, you know, interview because I just grew up idolizing them when I was, like, a wee tyke, you know? Like, you know, Charlie Adler's one. I hope I can get one day. Rob Polson, Maurice LaMarche. Um, if she had social media, I would say Tress McNeil. Like, there's so many, like, you know, voice actors and actors that I grew up idolizing. I hope one day, e like, even May, like, you know, I hope one day, like, you know, I get to do one with May Whitman if she's not ever busy. Like, you know, because I just grew up as a little boy just idolizing them. And... Uh, you doing the voices today, like, you know, doing this interview just totally made my day. Like, I feel like that seven-year-old, like, watching you guys all over again. You're very kind. Thank you so much, and Happy New Year. I really appreciate it. Happy New Year's, too. And uh, just one final question before we conclude. Um, would, like, if there's one day where I could just reunite, like, do, like, a reunion special with you and Sue for Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul Schools uh, episode for my show, would you be interested in doing it? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I know Susan travels a lot, 
she's busy she's got that beautiful little sprinter mercedes sprinter that she goes all over the country uh with and uh but um sure you know i i'm i i just love hanging with her in any case and hanging with you has been a privilege too so thank you so much it's an honor and privilege to you and i'm going to end with you know, I did this for Sue, but I want to do this for you because you truly deserve it. And that is a well-deserved chant. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. For all, not only for the memories, you know, not only doing this interview, but the memories you gave me as a kid growing up watching you on all those shows. So for that, I say thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Thank, thank you. you, Pat. Thank you. And uh, like I said, like, hope, I'd love to have you back on my show, like, in the near future, though, because this interview was so fun, so incredible. You made my day. And I can't thank you enough. I'm going to send you a copy of this. As soon as it's done edited, I'm going to send you a copy of this. Yeah. Oh, that's the other thing. I want to send this to my mom. My mom's 95 years old. And, uh, you know, I haven't been able to go back and see her because of the quarantine. And uh, so I had, this is the first uh, year I had to miss the holiday with her. And uh, so I think sending her this will give her a real, a real joy, some real joy. You got it. And as a loyal fan and friend, I'm going to like go on this right away as soon as I'm going to end this I, and I will uh, end the video chat and I'm going to work on the editing so I can send this to you right away. Thank you, Petey. Take Thank care. You. Take care. <laughs> Bye.